for he seemed always to avoid attracting attention, an enigmatical personage about whom little was known, except that he was a polished man of the world. People said that he resembled Byron, at least that his head was Byronic, but he was a bearded, tranquil Byron, who might live on a thousand years without growing old. Certainly an Englishman, it was more doubtful whether Phileas Fogg was a Londoner. He was never seen on change, nor at the bank, nor in the counting-rooms of the city. No ships ever came into London docks, of which he was the owner. He had no public employment. He had never been entered at any of the inns of court, either at Temple or Lincoln's Inn or Gray's Inn, nor had his voice ever resounded in the court of chancery or in the exchequer, or on the Queen's Beach, or the ecclesiastical courts. He certainly was not a manufacturer, nor was he a merchant or a gentleman farmer. His name was strange to the scientific and learned societies, and he never was known to take part in the sage deliberations of the Royal Institution, or the London Institution, the Artisans Association, or the Institution of Arts and Sciences. He belonged, in fact, to none of the numerous societies which swarm in the English capital, from the harmonic to that of the entomologists, founded mainly for the purpose of abolishing pernicious insects. Phileas Fogg was a member of the Reform, and that was all. The way in which he got admission to this exclusive club was simple enough. He was recommended by the Barings, with whom he had an open credit. His checks were regularly paid at sight from his account current, which was always flush. Was Phileas Fogg rich? Undoubtedly. But those who knew him best could not imagine how he had made his fortune, and Mr. Fogg was the last person to whom to apply for the information. He was not lavish, nor, on the contrary, avaricious. For whenever he knew that money was needed for a noble, useful, or benevolent purpose, he supplied it quietly and sometimes anonymously. He was, in short, the least communicative of men. He talked very little, and seemed all the more mysterious for his taciturn manner. His daily habits were quite open to observation, but whatever he did was so exactly the same thing that he had always done before that the wits of the curious were fairly puzzled. Had he traveled? It was likely, for no one seemed to know the world more familiarly. There was no spot so secluded that he did not appear to have an intimate acquaintance with it. He often corrected, with a few clear words, the thousand conjectures advanced by members of the club as to lost and unheard-of travellers, pointing out the true probabilities, and seeming as if gifted with a sort of second sight, so often did events justify his predictions. He must have travelled everywhere, at least in the spirit, it was at least certain that Phileas Fogg had not absented himself from London for many years. Those who were honoured by a better acquaintance with him than the rest declared that nobody could pretend to have ever seen him anywhere else. His sole pastimes were reading the papers and playing whist. He often won at this game, which, as a silent one, harmonised with his nature. But his winnings never went into his purse, being reserved as a fund for his charities. Mr. Fogg played not to win, but for the sake of playing. The game was, in his eyes, a contest, a struggle with a difficulty, yet a motionless, unwearying struggle, congenial to his tastes. Phileas Fogg was not known to have either wife or children, which may happen to the most honest people, either relatives or near friends, which is certainly more unusual. He lived alone in his house in Seville Row, whither none penetrated. A single domestic sufficed to serve him. He breakfasted and dined at the club, at hours mathematically fixed, in the same room, at the same table, never taking his meals with other members, much less bringing a guest with him, and went home at exactly midnight, only to retire at once to bed. He never used the cosy chambers which the Reform provides for its favored members, he passed ten hours out of the twenty-four in Seville Row, either in sleeping or making his toilet. When he chose to take a walk it was with a regular step in the entrance hall with its mosaic flooring, or in the circular gallery with its dome supported by twenty red porphyry ionic columns and illumined by blue painted windows. 
When he breakfasted or dined, all the resources of the club, its kitchens and pantries, its buttery and dairy, aided to crowd his table with their most succulent stores. He was served by the gravest waiters, in dress coats and shoes with swan-skin soles, who proffered the viands in special porcelain and on the finest linen. Club decanters of a lost mold contained his sherry, his port, and his cinnamon-spiced claret, while his beverages were refreshingly cooled with ice, brought at great cost from the American lakes. If to live in this style is to be eccentric, it must be confessed that there is something good in eccentricity. The mansion in Seville Row, though not sumptuous, was exceedingly comfortable. The habits of its occupant were such as to demand but little from the sole domestic, but Phileas Fogg required him to be almost superhumanly prompt and regular. On this very second of October he had dismissed James Forster because that luckless youth had brought him shaving water at eighty-four degrees Fahrenheit instead of eighty-six, and he was awaiting his successor, who was due at the house between eleven and half-past. Phileas Fogg was seated squarely in his armchair, his feet close together like those of a grenadier on parade, his hands resting on his knees, his body straight, his head erect. He was steadily watching a complicated clock which indicated the hours, the minutes, the seconds, the days, the months, and the years. At exactly half-past eleven, Mr. Fogg would, according to his daily habit, quit Seville Row and repair to the reform. A rap at this moment sounded on the door of the cozy apartment where Phileas Fogg was seated, and James Forster, the dismissed servant, appeared. "'The new servant,' said he. A young man of thirty advanced and bowed. "'You are a Frenchman, I believe?' asked Phileas Fogg. "'And your name is John?' "'Jean, if monsieur pleases,' replied the newcomer. "'Jean Passepartout.' a surname which has clung to me because I have a natural aptness for going out of one business into another. I believe I'm honest, monsieur, but to be outspoken I've had several trades. I've been an itinerant singer, a circus rider, when I used to vault like Leotard, and dance on a rope like Blondine. Then I got to be a professor of gymnastics so as to make better use of my talents, and then I was a sergeant fireman at Paris and assisted at many a big fire. But I quitted France five years ago, and wishing to taste the sweets of domestic life, took service as a valet here in England. Finding myself out of place, and hearing that Monsieur Phileas Fogg was the most exact and settled gentleman in the United Kingdom, I have come to Monsieur in the hope of living with him a tranquil life, and forgetting even the name of Passepartout. Passepartout suits me, responded Mr. Fogg. You are well recommended to me. I hear a good report of you. You know my conditions? Yes, monsieur. Good. What time is it? Twenty-two minutes after eleven, returned Passepartout, drawing an enormous silver watch from the depths of his pocket. You are too slow, said Mr. Fogg. Pardon me, monsieur. It is impossible. You are four minutes too slow. No matter, it's enough to mention the error. Now, from this moment, twenty-nine minutes after eleven a.m., this Wednesday, 2nd October, you are in my service. Phileas Fogg got up, took his hat in his left hand, put it on his head with an automatic motion, and went off without a word. Passepartout heard the street door shut once. It was his new master going out. He heard it shut again. It was his predecessor, James Forster, departing in his turn. Passepartout remained alone in the house in Seville Row. End of chapter 1 Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Translated by George Makepeace Towell Chapter 2 In which Passepartout is convinced that he has at last found his ideal. Faith, muttered Passepartout, somewhat flurried, I've seen people at Madame Tassot as lively as my new master. Madame Tassot's people, let it be said, are of wax, and are much visited in London. 
speech is all that is wanting to make them human. During his brief interview with Mr. Fogg, Passepartout had been carefully observing him. He appeared to be a man about forty years of age, with fine, handsome features, and a tall, well-shaped figure. His hair and whiskers were light, his forehead compact and unwrinkled, his face rather pale, his teeth magnificent. His countenance possessed in the highest degree what physiognomists call repose in action, a quality of those who act rather than talk. Calm and phlegmatic, with a clear eye, Mr. Fogg seemed a perfect type of that English composure which Angelica Kaufman has so skillfully represented on canvas. Seen in the various phases of his daily life, he gave the idea of being perfectly well balanced, as exactly regulated as a Leroy chronometer. Phileas Fogg was, indeed, exactitude personified, and this was betrayed even in the expression of his very hands and feet, for in men, as well as in animals, the limbs themselves are expressive of the passions. He was so exact that he was never in a hurry, was always ready, and was economical alike of his steps and his motions. He never took one step too many, and always went to his destination by the shortest cut. He made no superfluous gestures, and was never seen to be moved or agitated. He was the most deliberate person in the world, yet always reached his destination at the exact moment. He lived alone, and, so to speak, outside of every social relation, and as he knew that in this world account must be taken of friction, and that friction retards, he never rubbed against anybody. As for Passepartout, he was a true Parisian of Paris. Since he had abandoned his own country for England, taking service as a valet, he had in vain searched for a master after his own heart. Passepartout was by no means one of those pert dunces depicted by Molière with a bold gaze and a nose held high in the air. He was an honest fellow, with a pleasant face, lips a trifle protruding, soft-mannered and serviceable, with a good round head, such as one likes to see on the shoulders of a friend. His eyes were blue, his complexion rubicund, his figure almost portly and well-built, his body muscular and his physical powers fully developed by the exercises of his younger days. His brown hair was somewhat tumbled, for while the ancient sculptors are said to have known eighteen methods of arranging Minerva's tresses, Passepartout was familiar with but one of dressing his own. Three strokes of a large tooth comb completed his toilet. It would be rash to predict how Passepartout's lively nature would agree with Mr. Fogg. It was impossible to tell whether the new servant would turn out as absolutely methodical as his master required. Experience alone could solve the question. Passepartout had been a sort of vagrant in his early years, and now yearned for repose. But so far he had failed to find it, though he had already served in ten English houses. But he could not take root in any of these. With chagrin he found his masters invariably whimsical and irregular, constantly running about the country or on the lookout for adventure. His last master, young Lord Longferry, member of Parliament, after passing his nights in the Haymarket taverns, was too often brought home in the morning on policemen's shoulders. Passepartout, desirous of respecting the gentleman whom he served, ventured a mild remonstrance on such conduct, which, being ill-received, he took his leave. Hearing that Mr. Phileas Fogg was looking for a servant, and that his life was one of unbroken regularity, that he neither travelled nor stayed from home overnight, he felt sure that this would be the place he was after. He presented himself and was accepted, as has been seen. At half-past eleven, then, Passepartout found himself alone in the house in Seville Row. He began its inspection without delay, scouring it from cellar to garret. So clean, well-arranged, solemn a mansion pleased him. It seemed to him like a snail's shell, lighted and warmed by gas, which sufficed for both these purposes. When Passepartout reached the second story, he recognized at once the room which he was to inhabit, and he was well satisfied with it. 
electric bells and speaking tubes afforded communication with the lower stories, while on the mantel stood an electric clock, precisely like that in Mr. Fogg's bedchamber, both beating the same second at the same instant. "'That's good. That will do,' said Passepartout to himself. He suddenly observed, hung over the clock, a card which upon inspection proved to be a program of the daily routine of the house. It comprised all that was required of the servant, from eight in the morning exactly at which our Phileas Fogg rose, till half-past eleven, when he left the house for the Reform Club. All the details of service, the tea and toast at twenty-three minutes past eight, the shaving water at thirty-seven minutes past nine, and the toilet at twenty minutes before ten. Everything was regulated and foreseen that was to be done from half-past eleven a.m. till midnight, the hour at which the methodical gentleman retired. Mr. Fogg's wardrobe was amply supplied, and in the best taste. Each pair of trousers, coat, and vest bore a number, indicating the time of year and season at which they were in turn to be laid out for wearing, and the same system was applied to the master's shoes. In short, the house in Seville Row, which must have been a very temple of disorder and unrest under the illustrious but dissipated Sheridan, was coziness, comfort, and method idealized. There was no study, nor were there books, which would have been quite useless to Mr. Fogg, for at the Reform two libraries, one of general literature and the other of law and politics, were at his service. A moderate-sized safe stood in his bedroom, constructed so as to defy fire as well as burglars, but Passepartout found neither arms nor hunting weapons anywhere. Everything betrayed the most tranquil and peaceable habits. Having scrutinized the house from top to bottom, he rubbed his hands. A broad smile overspread his features, and he said joyfully, "'This is just what I wanted. Ah, oh, we shall get on together, Mr. Fogg and I. What a domestic and regular gentleman! A real machine! Well, I don't mind serving a machine.'" End of chapter 2 Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Translated by George Makepeace Towell Chapter 3 In Which a Conversation Takes Place Which Seems Likely to Cost Phileas Fogg Dear Phileas Fogg, having shut the door of his house at half-past eleven, and having put his right foot before his left five hundred and seventy-five times, and his left foot before his right five hundred and seventy-six times, reached the Reform Club an imposing edifice in Pall Mall, which could not have cost less than three millions. He repaired at once to the dining-room, the nine windows of which open upon a tasteful garden, where the trees were already gilded with an autumn coloring, and took his place at the habitual table, the cover of which had already been laid for him. His breakfast consisted of a side-dish, a broiled fish with reading sauce, a scarlet slice of roast beef garnished with mushrooms, a rhubarb and gooseberry tart, and a morsel of Cheshire cheese, the whole being washed down with several cups of tea, for which the reform is famous. He rose at thirteen minutes to one, and directed his steps towards the large hall, a sumptuous apartment adorned with lavishly framed paintings. A flunkey handed him an uncut times, which he proceeded to cut with a skill which betrayed familiarity with this delicate operation. The perusal of this paper absorbed Phileas Fogg until a quarter before four, whilst the standard, his next text, occupied him till the dinner hour. Dinner passed as breakfast had done, and Mr. Fogg reappeared in the reading-room and sat down to the Pall Mall at twenty minutes before six. Half an hour later several members of the Reform came in and drew up to the fireplace, where a coal fire was steadily burning. They were Mr. Fogg's usual partners at whist, Andrew Stewart, an engineer, John Sullivan, and Samuel Fallentine, bankers, Thomas Flanagan, a brewer, and Gauthier Ralph, one of the directors of the Bank of England, all rich and highly respectable personages even in a club which comprises the princes of English trade and finance. 
"'Well, Ralph,' said Thomas Flanagan, "'what about that robbery?' "'Oh,' replied Stuart, "'the bank will lose the money.' "'On the contrary,' broke in Ralph, "'I hope we may put our hands on the robber. Skilful detectives have been sent to all the principal ports of America and the continent, and he'll be a clever fellow if he slips through their fingers.' "'But have you got the robber's description?' asked Stuart. "'In the first place he is no robber at all,' returned Ralph positively. "'What, a fellow who makes off with fifty-five thousand pounds, no robber? No. Perhaps he's a manufacturer, then. The Daily Telegraph says that he is a gentleman.' It was Phileas Fogg, whose head now emerged from behind his newspapers, who made this remark. He bowed to his friends and entered into the conversation. The affair which formed its subject, and which was town talk, had occurred three days before at the Bank of England. A package of bank notes to the value of fifty-five thousand pounds had been taken from the principal cashier's table, that functionary being at the moment engaged in registering the receipt of three shillings and sixpence. Of course he could not have his eyes everywhere. Let it be observed that the Bank of England reposes a touching confidence in the honesty of the public. There are neither guards nor gratings to protect its treasures. Gold, silver, banknotes are freely exposed at the mercy of the first comer. A keen observer of English customs relates that being in one of the rooms of the bank one day, he had the curiosity to examine a gold ingot weighing some seven or eight pounds. He took it up, scrutinized it, passed it to his neighbor he to the next man, and so on until the ingot, going from hand to hand, was transferred to the end of a dark entry, nor did it return to its place for half an hour. Meanwhile the cashier had not so much as raised his head, but in the present instance things had not gone so smoothly. The package of notes not being found when five o'clock sounded from the ponderous clock in the drawing office, the amount was passed to the account of profit and loss. As soon as the robbery was discovered, picked detectives hastened off to Liverpool, Glasgow, Harve, Suez, Brindisi, New York, and other ports, inspired by the proffered reward of two thousand pounds and five per cent on the sum that might be recovered. Detectives were also charged with narrowly watching those who arrived at or left London by rail, and a judicial examination was at once entered upon. There were real grounds for supposing, as the Daily Telegraph said, that the thief did not belong to a professional band. On the day of the robbery a well-dressed gentleman of polished manners, and with a well-to-do air, had been observed going to and fro in the paying room where the crime was committed. A description of him was easily procured and sent to the detectives, and some hopeful spirits, of whom Ralph was one, did not despair of his apprehension. The papers and clubs were full of the affair, and everywhere people were discussing the probabilities of a successful pursuit, and the Reform Club was especially agitated, several of its members being bank officials. Ralph would not concede that the work of the detectives was likely to be in vain, for he thought that the prize offered would greatly stimulate their zeal and activity. But Stuart was far from sharing this confidence and as they placed themselves at the whist-table they continued to argue the matter. Stuart and Flanagan played together, while Phileas Fogg had Valentine for his partner. As the game proceeded the conversation ceased, excepting between the rubbers when it revived again. "'I maintain,' said Stuart, "'that the chances are in favor of the thief who must be a shrewd fellow.' "'Well, but where can he fly to?' asked Ralph. No country is safe for him. Pshaw! Where could he go, then? Oh, I don't know that. The world is big enough. It was once, said Phileas Fogg, in a low tone. Cut, sir, he added, handing the cards to Thomas Flanagan. The discussion fell during the rubber, after which Stuart took up its thread. What do you mean by once? Has the world grown smaller? Certainly, returned Ralph. I agree with Mr. Fogg. The world has grown smaller, since a man can now go round it ten times more quickly than a hundred years ago, and that is why the search for this thief will be more likely to succeed, and also why the thief can get away more easily. Be so good as to play, Mr. Stewart, said Phileas Fogg. But the incredulous Stewart was not convinced, 
and when the hand was finished said eagerly, "'You have a strange way, Ralph, of proving that the world has grown smaller. So because you can go round it in three months—' "'In eighty days,' interrupted Phileas Fogg. "'That is true, gentlemen,' added John Sullivan. "'Only eighty days, now that the section between Rothel and Allahabad on the great Indian Peninsula Railway has been opened, here is the estimate made by the Daily Telegraph. From London to Suez via Mont Sinus and Brindisi by rail and steamboats, seven days. From Suez to Bombay by steamer, thirteen days. From Bombay to Calcutta by rail, three days. From Calcutta to Hong Kong by steamer, thirteen days. From Hong Kong to Yokohama, Japan by steamer, six days. From Yokohama to San Francisco by steamer, twenty-two days. From San Francisco to New York by rail, seven days. From New York to London by steamer and rail, nine days. Total, eighty days. "'Yes, in eighty days!' exclaimed Stuart, who in his excitement made a false deal. "'But that doesn't take into account bad weather, contrary winds, shipwrecks, railway accidents, and so on.' "'All included,' returned Phileas Fogg, continuing to play despite the discussion. "'But suppose the Hindus or Indians pull up the rails,' replied Stuart. "'Suppose they stop the trains, pillage the luggage vans, and scalp the passengers?' "'All included,' calmly retorted Fogg, adding, as he threw down the cards, two trumps. Stuart, whose turn it was to deal, gathered them up and went on. "'You were right, theoretically, Mr. Fogg, but practically—' "'Practically also, Mr. Stuart. I'd like to see you do it in eighty days. It depends on you. Shall we go?' Heaven preserve me, but I would wager four thousand pounds that such a journey made under these conditions is impossible.' "'Quite possible, on the contrary,' returned Mr. Fogg. "'Well, make it, then. The journey round the world in eighty days? Yes. I should like nothing better. When? At once. Only I warn you that I shall do it at your expense.' "'It's absurd,' cried Stuart, who was beginning to be annoyed at the persistency of his friend. "'Come, let's go on with the game.' "'Deal over again, then,' said Phileas Fogg. "'There's a false deal.' Stuart took up the pack with a feverish hand, then suddenly put them down again. "'Well, Mr. Fogg,' said he, "'it shall be so. I will wager the four thousand on it.' "'Calm yourself, my dear Stuart,' said Valentine. "'It's only a joke.' "'When I say I'll wager,' returned Stuart, "'I mean it.' "'All right,' said Mr. Fogg, and turning to the others he continued. I have a deposit of twenty thousand at Bearings, which I will willingly risk upon it. Twenty thousand pounds, cried Sullivan, twenty thousand pounds which you would lose by a single accidental delay. The unforeseen does not exist, quietly replied Phileas Fogg. But, Mr. Fogg, eighty days are only the estimate of the least possible time in which the journey can be made. A well-used minimum suffices for everything. "'But in order not to exceed it, you must jump mathematically from the trains upon the steamers and from the steamers upon the trains again. I will jump mathematically.' "'You are joking. A true Englishman doesn't joke when he is talking about so serious a thing as a wager,' replied Phileas Fogg solemnly. "'I will bet twenty thousand pounds against anyone who wishes that I will make the tour of the world in eighty days or less, in nineteen hundred and twenty hours, or a hundred and fifteen thousand two hundred minutes. Do you accept?' "'We accept,' replied Mr. Stuart, Valentine, Sullivan, Flanagan, and Ralph, after consulting each other. "'Good,' said Mr. Fogg. "'The train leaves for Dover at a quarter before nine. I will take it.' "'This very evening?' asked Stuart. "'This very evening,' returned Phileas Fogg. He took out and consulted a pocket almanac, and added, "'As today is Wednesday, the 2nd of October, I shall be due in London in this very room of the Reform Club on Saturday, the 21st of December, at a quarter before 9 p.m., or else the 20,000 pounds now deposited in my name at Bearings will belong to you in fact and in right, gentlemen. Here is a check for the amount. 
A memorandum of the wager was at once drawn up and signed by the six parties, during which Phileas Fogg preserved a stoical composure. He certainly did not bet to win, and had only staked the twenty thousand pounds, half of his fortune, because he foresaw that he might have to expend the other half to carry out this difficult, not to say unattainable, project. As for his antagonists, they seemed much agitated, not so much by the value of their stake as because they had some scruples about betting under conditions so difficult to their friend. The clock struck seven, and the party offered to suspend the game so that Mr. Fogg might make his preparations for departure. "'I am quite ready now,' was his tranquil response. "'Diamonds or trumps. Be so good as to play, gentlemen.'" End of chapter 3 Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Translated by George Makepeace Towell Chapter 4 In Which Phileas Fogg Astounds Passepartout, His Servant Having won twenty guineas at whist and taken leave of his friends, Phileas Fogg at twenty-five minutes past seven left the Reform Club. Passepartout, who had conscientiously studied the program of his duties, was more than surprised to see his master guilty of the inexactness of appearing at this unaccustomed hour, for, according to rule, he was not due in Seville Row until precisely midnight. Mr. Fogg repaired to his bedroom and called out, Passepartout! Passepartout did not reply. It could not be he who was called. It was not the right hour. Passepartout! repeated Mr. Fogg, without raising his voice. Passepartout made his appearance. "'I've called you twice,' observed his master. "'But it is not midnight,' responded the other, showing his watch. "'I know it. I don't blame you. We start for Dover and Calais in ten minutes.' A puzzled grin overspread Passepartout's round face. Clearly he had not comprehended his master. "'Monsieur is going to leave home?' "'Yes,' returned Phileas Fogg. We are going round the world. Passepartout opened wide his eyes, raised his eyebrows, held up his hands, and seemed about to collapse, so overcome was he with stupefied astonishment. Round the world, he murmured. In eighty days, responded Mr. Fogg. So we haven't a moment to lose. But the trunks, gasped Passepartout, unconsciously swaying his head from right to left, We'll have no trunks, only a carpet-bag with two shirts and three pairs of stockings for me, and the same for you. We'll buy our clothes on the way. Bring down my mackintosh and traveling cloak and some stout shoes, though we shall do little walking. Make haste. Passepartout tried to reply, but could not. He went out, mounted to his own room, fell into a chair, and muttered, That's good, that is, and I, who wanted to remain quiet. He mechanically set about making the preparations for departure. Around the world in eighty days! Was his master a fool? No. Was this a joke, then? They were going to Dover. Good. To Calais. Good again. After all, Passepartout, who had been away from France five years, would not be sorry to set foot on his native soil again. Perhaps they would go as far as Paris, and it would do his eyes good to see Paris once more. But surely a gentleman so chary of his steps would stop there, no doubt. But then it was none the less true that he was going away, this so domestic person hitherto. By eight o'clock Passepartout had packed the modest carpet-bag containing the wardrobes of his master and himself. Then, still troubled in mind, he carefully shut the door of his room and descended to Mr. Fogg. Mr. Fogg was quite ready under his arm might have been observed a red-bound copy of Bradshaw's Continental Railway, Steam Transit, and General Guide, with its timetables showing the arrival and departure of steamers and railways. He took the carpet-bag, opened it, and slipped into it a goodly roll of Bank of England notes, which would pass wherever he might go. "'You have forgotten nothing?' asked he. "'Nothing, monsieur. My mackintosh and cloak. Here they are. Good.' Take this carpet-bag, handing it to Passepartout. Take good care of it, for there are twenty thousand pounds in it. Passepartout nearly dropped the bag as if the twenty thousand pounds were in gold and weighed him down. Master and man then descended. The street door was double-locked, 
and at the end of Seville Row they took a cab and drove rapidly to Charing Cross. The cab stopped before the railway station at twenty minutes past eight. Passepartout jumped off the box and followed his master, who, after paying the cabman, was about to enter the station when a poor beggar woman, with a child in her arms, her naked feet smeared with mud, her head covered with a wretched bonnet from which hung a tattered feather, and her shoulders shrouded in a ragged shawl, approached and mournfully asked for alms. Mr. Fogg took out the twenty guineas he had just won at whist, and handed them to the beggar, saying, here, my good woman, I'm glad that I met you, and passed on. Passepartout had a moist sensation about the eyes. His master's action touched his susceptible heart. Two first-class tickets for Paris having been speedily purchased, Mr. Fogg was crossing the station to the train when he perceived his five friends of the reform. "'Well, gentlemen,' said he, "'I'm off, you see.' and if you will examine my passport when I get back, you will be able to judge whether I have accomplished the journey agreed upon. Oh, that would be quite unnecessary, Mr. Fogg, said Ralph politely. We will trust your word as a gentleman of honor. You do not forget when you are due in London again, asked Stuart. In eighty days, on Saturday, the 21st of December, 1872, at a quarter before nine p.m. Good-bye, gentlemen. Phileas Fogg and his servant seated themselves in a first-class carriage at twenty minutes before nine. Five minutes later the whistle screamed and the train slowly glided out of the station. The night was dark and a fine steady rain was falling. Phileas Fogg, snugly ensconced in his corner, did not open his lips. Passepartout, not yet recovered from his stupefaction, clung mechanically to the carpet-bag with its enormous treasure. Just as the train was whirling through Sydenham, Passepartout suddenly uttered a cry of despair. "'What's the matter?' asked Mr. Fogg. "'Alas! In my hurry I—I I forgot—' "'What?' "'To turn off the gas in my room.' "'Very well, young man,' returned Mr. Fogg coolly. "'It will burn at your expense.'" End of chapter 4 Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Translated by George Makepeace Towell Chapter 5 In Which a New Species of Funds Unknown to the Moneyed Men Appears on Chain Phileas Fogg rightly suspected that his departure from London would create a lively sensation at the West End. The news of the bet spread through the Reform Club and afforded an exciting topic of conversation to its members. From the club it soon got into the papers throughout England. The boasted tour of the world was talked about, disputed, argued with as much warmth as if the subject were another Alabama claim. Some took sides with Phileas Fogg, but the large majority shook their heads and declared against him. It was absurd, impossible, they declared, that the tour of the world could be made, except theoretically and on paper, in this minimum of time, and with the existing means of traveling. The Times, Standard, Morning Post, and Daily News, and twenty other highly respectable newspapers scouted Mr. Fogg's project as madness. The Daily Telegraph alone hesitatingly supported him. People in general thought him a lunatic, and blamed his Reform Club friends for having accepted a wager which betrayed the mental aberration of its proposer. Articles no less passionate than logical appeared on the question, for geography is one of the pet subjects of the English, and the columns devoted to Phileas Fogg's venture were eagerly devoured by all classes of readers. At first some rash individuals, principally of the gentler sex, espoused his cause, which became still more popular when the illustrated London news came out with his portrait, copied from a photograph in the Reform Club. A few readers of the Daily Telegraph even dared to say, Why not, after all? Stranger things have come to pass. At last a long article appeared on the 7th of October in the Bulletin of the Royal Geographical Society, which treated the question from every point of view and demonstrated the utter folly of the enterprise. Everything, it said, was against the travelers, every obstacle imposed alike by man and by nature. A miraculous agreement of the times of departure and arrival, which was impossible, was absolutely necessary to his success, 
He might perhaps reckon on the arrival of trains at the designated hours in Europe, where the distances were relatively moderate, but when he calculated upon crossing India in three days, and the United States in seven, could he rely beyond misgiving upon accomplishing his task? There were accidents to machinery, the liability of trains to run off the line, collisions, bad weather, the blocking up by snow. Were not all these against Phileas Fogg? Would he not find himself when traveling by steamer in winter at the mercy of the winds and fogs? Is it uncommon for the best ocean steamers to be two or three days behind time? But a single delay would suffice to fatally break the chain of communication. Should Phileas Fogg once miss, even by an hour, a steamer, he would have to wait for the next, and that would irrevocably render his attempt vain. This article made a great deal of noise, and, being copied into all the papers, seriously depressed the advocates of the rash tourist. Everybody knows that England is the world of betting men, who are of a higher class than mere gamblers. To bet is in the English temperament. Not only the members of the reform, but the general public made heavy wagers for or against Phileas Fogg, who was set down in the betting books as if he were a racehorse. Bonds were issued and made their appearance on change. Phileas Fogg bonds were offered at par or at a premium, and a great business was done in them but five days after the article in the bulletin of the Geographical Society appeared, the demand began to subside. Phileas Fogg declined. They were offered by packages at first of five, then of ten, until at last nobody would take less than twenty, fifty, a hundred. Lord Albemarle, an elderly paralytic gentleman, was now the only advocate of Phileas Fogg left. This noble lord, who was fastened to his chair, would have given his fortune to be able to make the tour of the world if it took ten years, and he bet five thousand pounds on Phileas Fogg. When the folly as well as the uselessness of the adventure was pointed out to him, he contented himself with replying, If the thing is feasible, the first to do it ought to be an Englishman. The Fogg party dwindled more and more. Everybody was going against him and the bet stood a hundred and fifty and two hundred to one, and a week after his departure an incident occurred which deprived him of backers at any price. The commissioner of police was sitting in his office at nine o'clock one evening when the following telegraphic dispatch was put into his hands. Suez to London, Rowan, commissioner of police, Scotland Yard. I found the bank robber, Phileas Fogg. Send without delay warrant of arrest to Bombay. Fix, detective. The effect of this dispatch was instantaneous. The polished gentleman disappeared to give place to the bank robber. His photograph, which was hung with those of the rest of the members of the Reform Club, was minutely examined, and it betrayed feature by feature the description of the robber which had been provided to the police. The mysterious habits of Phileas Fogg were recalled, his solitary ways, his sudden departure, and it seemed clear that in undertaking a tour round the world on the pretext of a wager he had had no other end in view than to elude the detectives and throw them off his track. End of chapter 5 Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Translated by George Makepeace Towell Chapter 6 In Which Fix the Detective Betrays a Very Natural Impatience the circumstances under which this telegraphic dispatch about Phileas Fogg was sent were as follows. The steamer Mongolia, belonging to the Peninsular and Oriental Company, built of iron, of 2,800 tons burden and 500 horsepower, was due at 11 o'clock a.m. on Wednesday, the 9th of October, at Suez. The Mongolia plied regularly between Brindisi and Bombay via the Suez Canal, and was one of the fastest steamers belonging to the company, always making more than ten knots an hour between Brindisi and Suez, and nine and a half between Suez and Bombay. Two men were promenading up and down the wharves, among the crowd of natives and strangers who were sojourning at this once straggling village, now thanks to the enterprise of M. Lessops, a fast-growing town. One was the British consul at Suez, who, despite the prophecies of the English government and the unfavorable predictions of Stephenson, 
was in the habit of seeing from his office window English ships daily passing to and fro on the great canal, by which the old roundabout route from England to India by the Cape of Good Hope was abridged by at least a half. The other was a small, sight-built personage with a nervous, intelligent face and bright eyes peering out from under eyebrows which he was incessantly twitching. He was just now manifesting unmistakable signs of impatience, nervously pacing up and down, and unable to stand still for a moment. This was Fix, one of the detectives who had been dispatched from England in search of the bank robber. It was his task to narrowly watch every passenger who arrived at Suez, and to follow up all who seemed to be suspicious characters, or bore a resemblance to the description of the criminal which he had received two days before from the police headquarters at London. The detective was evidently inspired by the hope of obtaining the splendid reward which would be the prize of success, and awaited with feverish impatience, easy to understand, the arrival of the steamer Mongolia. "'So you say, Consul,' asked he for the twentieth time, "'that this steamer is never behind time?' "'No, Mr. Fix,' replied the Consul. "'She was bespoken yesterday at Port Said, and the rest of the way is of no account to such a craft. I repeat that the Mongolia has been in advance of the time required by the company's regulations, and gained the prize awarded for excess of speed. Does she come directly from Brindisi? Directly from Brindisi. She takes on the Indian mails there, and she left there Saturday at 5 p.m. Have patience, Mr. Fix. She will not be late. But really I don't see how, from the description you have, you will be able to recognize your man, even if he is on board the Mongolia. A man rather feels the presence of these fellows, Consul, than recognizes them. You must have a scent for them, and a scent is like a sixth sense which combines hearing, seeing, and smelling. I've arrested more than one of these gentlemen in my time, and if my thief is on board I'll answer for it. He'll not slip through my fingers." "'I hope so, Mr. Fix, for it was a heavy robbery.' "'A magnificent robbery, Consul. Fifty-five thousand pounds. We don't often have such windfalls. Burglars are getting to be so contemptible nowadays. A fellow gets hung for a handful of shillings.' "'Mr. Fix,' said the Consul, "'I like your way of talking, and hope you'll succeed. But I fear you will find it far from easy.' Don't you see the description which you have there has a singular resemblance to an honest man? Consul, remarked the detective dogmatically, great robbers always resemble honest folk. Fellows who have rascally faces have only one course to take, and that is to remain honest, otherwise they would be arrested offhand. The artistic thing is to unmask honest countenances. It's no light task, I admit, but a real art. Mr. Fix evidently was not wanting in a tinge of self-conceit. Little by little the scene on the quay became more animated. Sailors of various nations, merchants, shipbrokers, porters, fellows, bustled to and fro as if the steamer were immediately expected. The weather was clear and slightly chilly. The minarets of the town loomed above the houses in the pale rays of the sun. A jetty pier, some two thousand yards along, extended into the roadstead. A number of fishing smacks and coasting boats, some retaining the fantastic fashion of ancient galleys, were discernible on the Red Sea. As he passed among the busy crowd, Fix, according to habit, scrutinized the passers-by with a keen, rapid glance. It was now half-past ten. "'The steamer doesn't come!' he exclaimed as the port clock struck. "'She can't be far off now,' returned his companion. How long will she stop at Suez? Four hours, long enough to get in her coal. It is thirteen hundred and ten miles from Suez to Aden, at the other end of the Red Sea, and she has to take in a fresh supply of coal. And does she go from Suez directly to Bombay? Without putting in anywhere. Good, said Fix. If the robber is on board, he will no doubt get off at Suez, so as to reach the Dutch or French colonies in Asia by some other route. He ought to know that he would not be safe an hour in India, which is English soil, unless, objected the consul, he is exceptionally shrewd. An English criminal, you know, is always better concealed in London than anywhere else. This observation furnished the detective food for thought, 
and meanwhile the consul went away to his office. Fix, left alone, was more impatient than ever, having a presentiment that the robber was on board the Mongolia. If he had indeed left London, intending to reach the New World, he would naturally take the route via India, which was less watched and more difficult to watch than that of the Atlantic. But Fix's reflections were soon interrupted by a succession of sharp whistles, which announced the arrival of the Mongolia. The porters and fellows rushed down the quay, and a dozen boats pushed off from the shore to go and meet the steamer. Soon her gigantic hull appeared passing along between the banks, and eleven o'clock struck as she anchored in the road. She brought an unusual number of passengers, some of whom remained on deck to scan the picturesque panorama of the town, while the greater part disembarked in the boats and landed on the quay. Fix took up a position and carefully examined each face and figure which made its appearance. Presently one of the passengers, after vigorously pushing his way through the importunate crowd of porters, came up to him and politely asked him if he could point out the English consulate, at the same time showing a passport which he wished to have visaed. Fix instinctively took the passport, and with a rapid glance read the description of its bearer. An involuntary motion of surprise nearly escaped him, for the description in the passport was identical with that of the bank robber which he had received from Scotland Yard. "'Is this your passport?' asked he. "'No, it's my master's. And your master is. He stayed on board. But he must go to the consul's in person, so as to establish his identity. Oh, is that necessary? Quite indispensable. And where is the consulate? There, on the corner of the square, said Fix, pointing to a house two hundred steps off. I'll go and fetch my master, who won't be much pleased, however, to be disturbed. The passenger bowed to Fix and returned to the steamer. End of chapter 6 Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Translated by George Makepeace Towell Chapter 7 Which Once More Demonstrates the Uselessness of Passports as Age to Detectives The detective passed down the quay and rapidly made his way to the consul's office, where he was at once admitted to the presence of that official. Consul! said he, without preamble. I have strong reasons for believing that my man is a passenger on the Mongolia, and he narrated what had just passed concerning the passport. Well, Mr. Fix, replied the consul, I shall not be sorry to see the rascal's face, but perhaps he won't come here, that is, if he is the person you suppose him to be. A robber doesn't quite like to leave traces of his flight behind him, and besides he is not obliged to have his passport countersigned. If he is as shrewd as I think he is, Consul, he will come. To have his passport visaed? Yes, passports are only good for annoying honest folks, and aiding in the flight of rogues. I assure you it will be quite the thing for him to do, but I hope you will not visa the passport. Why not? If the passport is genuine, I have no right to refuse." Still, I must keep this man here until I can get a warrant to arrest him from London. Ah, that's your lookout. But I cannot— The consul did not finish his sentence, for as he spoke, a knock was heard at the door, and two strangers entered, one of whom was the servant whom Fix had met on the quay. The other, who was his master, held out his passport with the request that the consul would do him the favor to visa it. The consul took the document and carefully read it, whilst Fix observed, or rather devoured, the stranger with his eyes from a corner of the room. "'You are Mr. Phileas Fogg?' said the consul, after reading the passport. "'I am. And this man is your servant? He is a Frenchman named Passepartout. You are from London? Yes. And you are going to Bombay? Very good, sir. You know that a visa is useless, and that no passport is required?' "'I know it, sir,' replied Phileas Fogg, "'but I wish to prove by your visa that I came by Suez.' "'Very well, sir.' The consul proceeded to sign and date the passport, after which he added his official seal. Mr. Fogg paid the customary fee, coldly bowed, and went out, followed by his servant. "'Well?' queried the detective. "'Well, he looks and acts like a perfectly honest man,' replied the consul. "'Possibly, but that is not the question.' 
Do you think, Consul, that this phlegmatic gentleman resembles, feature by feature, the robber whose description I have received? I concede that. But then, you know, all descriptions— I'll make certain of it, interrupted Fix. The servant seems to me less mysterious than the master. Besides, he's a Frenchman and can't help talking. Excuse me for a little while, Consul. Fix started off in search of Passepartout. Meanwhile, Mr. Fogg, after leaving the consulate, repaired to the quay, gave some orders to Passepartout, went off to the Mongolia in a boat, and descended to his cabin. He took up his notebook, which contained the following memoranda. Left London Wednesday, October 2nd, at 8.45 p.m. Reached Paris Thursday, October 3rd, at 7.20 a.m. Left Paris Thursday at 8.40 a.m., Reached Turin by Mont Cenis Friday, October 4th at 6.35 a.m. Left Turin Friday at 7.20 a.m. Arrived at Brindisi Saturday, October 5th at 4 p.m. Sailed on the Mongolia Saturday at 5 p.m. Reached Suez Wednesday, October 9th at 11 a.m. Total of hours spent 158 plus, or in days six days and a half. These dates were inscribed in an itinerary divided into columns, indicating the month, the day of the month, and the day for the stipulated and actual arrivals at each principal point, Paris, Brindisi, Suez, Bombay, Calcutta, Singapore, Hong Kong, Yokohama, San Francisco, New York, and London, from the 2nd of October to the 21st of December and giving a space for setting down the gain made or the loss suffered on arrival at each locality. This methodical record thus contained an account of everything needed, and Mr. Fogg always knew whether he was behind hand or in advance of his time. On this Friday, October 9th, he noted his arrival at Suez, and observed that he had as yet neither gain nor lost. He sat down quietly to breakfast in his cabin, never once thinking of inspecting the town, being one of those Englishmen who were wont to see foreign countries through the eyes of their domestics. End of chapter 7 Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Translated by George Makepeace Towell Chapter 8 In Which Passepartout Talks Rather More, Perhaps, Than Is Prudent Fix soon rejoined Passepartout, who was lounging and looking about on the quay, as if he did not feel that he, at least, was obliged not to see anything. "'Well, my friend,' said the detective, coming up with him, "'is your passport visa?' "'Ah, oh, it's you, is it, monsieur?' responded Passepartout. "'Thanks. Yes, the passport is all right.' "'And are you looking about you?' "'Yes, but we travel so fast that I seem to be journeying in a dream. So this is Suez.' yes in egypt certainly in egypt and in africa in africa in africa repeated passepartout just think monsieur i had no idea that we should go farther than paris and all that i saw of paris was between twenty minutes past seven and twenty minutes before nine in the morning between the northern and the lions stations through the windows of a car and in a driving rain how I regret not having seen once more Père Lachaise and the circus in the Champ Elysee. You are in a great hurry, then? I am not, but my master is. By the way, I must buy some shoes and shirts. We came away without trunks, only with a carpet bag. I will show you an excellent shop for getting what you want. Really, monsieur, you are very kind. And they walked off together, past Partout, chatting volubly as they went along. "'Above all,' said he, "'don't let me lose the steamer. "'You have plenty of time. "'It's only twelve o'clock.' "'Passepartout pulled out his big watch. Twelve, he exclaimed. "'Why, it's only eight minutes before ten. "'Your watch is slow. "'My watch? "'A family watch, monsieur, "'which has come down from my great-grandfather. "'It doesn't vary five minutes in the year. "'It's a perfect chronometer. "'Look you.' "'I see how it is,' said Fix. You have kept London time, which is two hours behind that of Suez. You ought to regulate your watch at noon in each country. I regulate my watch? Never. Well, then, it will not agree with the sun. So much the worse for the sun, monsieur. The sun will be wrong, then. And the worthy fellow returned the watch to its fob with a defiant gesture. 
After a few minutes' silence, Fix resumed. "'You left your London hastily, then?' "'I rather think so. Last Friday at eight o'clock in the evening Monsieur Fogg came home from his club, and three-quarters of an hour afterwards we were off. But where is your master going?' "'Always straight ahead. He is going round the world.' "'Round the world?' cried Fix. "'Yes, and in eighty days. He says it is on a wager, but between us I don't believe a word of it. That wouldn't be common sense. There's something else in the wind.' "'Ah, Mr. Fogg is a character, is he?' "'I should say he was. Is he rich?' "'No doubt, for he is carrying an enormous sum in brand-new banknotes with him.' and he doesn't spare the money on the way either he has offered a large reward to the engineer of the mongolia if he gets us to bombay well in advance of time and you have known your master a long time why no i entered his service the very day we left london the effect of these replies upon the already suspicious and excited detective may be imagined the hasty departure from london soon after the robbery the large sum carried by mr fogg the eagerness to reach distant countries, the pretext of an eccentric and foolhardy bet, all confirmed Fix in his theory. He continued to pump poor Passepartout, and learned that he really knew little or nothing of his master who lived a solitary existence in London, was said to be rich, though no one knew whence came his riches, and was mysterious and impenetrable in his affairs and habits. Fix felt sure that Phileas Fogg would not land at Suez, but was really going on to Bombay. "'Is Bombay far from here?' asked Passepartout. "'Pretty far. It is a ten days' voyage by sea. And in what country is Bombay? India? In Asia? Certainly.' "'The deuce! I was going to tell you there's one thing that worries me. My burner. What burner?' my gas-burner, which I forgot to turn off, and which is at this moment burning at my expense. I have calculated, monsieur, that I lose two shillings every four and twenty hours, exactly sixpence more than I earn, and you will understand that the longer our journey did Fix pay any attention to Passepartout's trouble about the gas. It is not probable. He was not listening, but was cogitating a project." Passepartout, and he had now reached the shop, where Fix left his companion to make his purchases, after recommending him not to miss the steamer, and hurried back to the consulate. Now that he was fully convinced, Fix had quite recovered his equanimity. "'Consul,' said he, "'I have no longer any doubt. I have spotted my man. He passes himself off as an odd stick, who is going round the world in eighty days.' "'Then he's a sharp fellow,' returned the consul and counts on returning to London after putting the police of the two countries off his track. "'We'll see about that,' replied Fix. "'But are you not mistaken?' "'I am not mistaken. Why was this robber so anxious to prove by the visa that he had passed through Suez? Why, I have no idea. But listen to me.' He reported in a few words the most important parts of his conversation with Passepartout. "'In short,' said the consul, "'appearances are wholly against this man. "'And what are you going to do? "'Send a dispatch to London for a warrant of arrest "'to be dispatched instantly to Bombay. "'Take passage on board the Mongolia, "'follow my rogue to India, "'and there, on English ground, arrest him politely, "'with my warrant in my hand and my hand on his shoulder.' "'Having uttered these words with a cool, careless air, "'the detective took leave of the consul, and repaired to the telegraph office, whence he sent the dispatch which we have seen to the London police office. A quarter of an hour later found Fix with a small bag in his hand, proceeding on board the Mongolia, and ere many moments longer the noble steamer rode out at full steam upon the waters of the Red Sea. End of chapter 8 Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Translated by George Makepeace Towell Chapter 9 In Which the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean Prove Propitious to the Designs of Phileas Fogg The distance between Suez and Aden is precisely 1,310 miles, and the regulations of the company allow the steamers 138 hours in which to traverse it. The Mongolia, thanks to the vigorous exertions of the engineer, seemed likely, so rapid was her speed, to reach her destination considerably within that time. 
The greater part of the passengers from Brindisi were bound for India, some for Bombay, others for Calcutta, by way of Bombay, the nearest route thither now that a railway crosses the Indian peninsula. Among the passengers was a number of officials and military officers of various grades, the latter being either attached to the regular British forces or commanding the Sepoy troops and receiving high salaries ever since the central government has assumed the powers of the East India Company, for the sub-lieutenants get 280 pounds, brigadiers 2,400 pounds, and generals of divisions 4,000 pounds. What with the military men, a number of rich young Englishmen on their travels, and the hospitable efforts of the purser, the time passed quickly on the Mongolia. The best of fare was spread upon the cabin tables at breakfast, lunch, dinner, and the eight o'clock supper, and the ladies scrupulously changed their toilets twice a day, and the hours were whirled away when the sea was tranquil with music, dancing, and games. But the Red Sea is full of caprice, and often boisterous like most long and narrow gulfs. When the wind came from the African or Asian coast, the Mongolia with her long hull rolled fearfully. Then the ladies speedily disappeared below. The pianos were silent. Singing and dancing suddenly ceased. Yet the good ship plowed straight on, unretarded by wind or wave, towards the straits of Babel Mandeb. What was Phileas Fogg doing all this time? It might be thought that, in his anxiety, he would be constantly watching the changes of the wind, the disorderly raging of the billows every chance, in short, which might force the Mongolia to slacken her speed, and thus interrupt his journey. But if he thought of these possibilities, he did not betray the fact by any outward sign. Always the same impassable member of the Reform Club, whom no incident could surprise, as unvarying as the ship's chronometers, and seldom having the curiosity even to go up on the deck, he passed through the memorable scenes of the Red Sea with cold indifference, did not care to recognize the historic towns and villages which, along its borders, raised their picturesque outlines against the sky, and betrayed no fear of the dangers of the Arabic Gulf, which the old historians always spoke of with horror, and upon which the ancient navigators never ventured without propitiating the gods by ample sacrifices. How did this eccentric personage pass his time on the Mongolia? He made his four hearty meals every day, regardless of the most persistent rolling and pitching on the part of the steamer, and he played whist indefatigably, for he had found partners as enthusiastic in the game as himself. A tax collector on the way to his post at Goa, the Reverend Decimus Smith returning to his parish at Bombay, and a brigadier general of the English army who was about to rejoin his brigade at Benares, made up the party and with Mr. Fogg played whist by the hour, together in absorbing silence. As for Passepartout, he too had escaped seasickness, and took his meals conscientiously in the forward cabin. He rather enjoyed the voyage, for he was well fed and well lodged, took a great interest in the scenes through which they were passing, and consoled himself with the delusion that his master's whim would end at Bombay. He was pleased on the day after leaving Suez to find on deck the obliging person with whom he had walked and chatted on the quays. "'If I am not mistaken,' said he, approaching this person, with his most amiable smile, "'you are the gentleman who so kindly volunteered to guide me at Suez.' "'Ah, I quite recognize you. You are the servant of the strange Englishman.' "'Just so, Monsieur Fix.' "'Monsieur Fix,' resumed Passepartout, I'm charmed to find you on board. Where are you bound? Like you, to Bombay. That's capital. Have you made this trip before? Several times. I am one of the agents of the Peninsular Company. Then you know India. Why, yes, replied Fix, who spoke cautiously. A curious place, this India. Oh, very curious. Mosques, minarets, temples, fakers, pagodas, tigers, snakes, and elephants. I hope you will have ample time to see the sights. I hope so, Monsieur Fix. You see, a man of sound sense ought not to spend his life jumping from a steamer upon a railway train and from a railway train upon a steamer again, pretending to make the tour of the world in eighty days. No, all these gymnastics, you may be sure, will cease at Bombay." 
"'And Mr. Fogg is getting on well?' asked Fix, in the most natural tone in the world. "'Quite well, and I too. I eat like a famished ogre. It's the sea air. But I never see your master on deck. Never. He hasn't the least curiosity. Do you know, Mr. Passepartout, that this pretended tour in eighty days may conceal some secret errand, perhaps a diplomatic mission?' "'Faith, Monsieur Fix, I assure you I know nothing about it, nor would I give half a crown to find out.' After this meeting, Passepartout and Fix got into the habit of chatting together, the latter making it a point to gain the worthy man's confidence. He frequently offered him a glass of whiskey or pale ale in the steamer bar-room, which Passepartout never failed to accept with graceful alacrity, mentally pronouncing Fix the best of good fellows. Meanwhile the Mongolia was pushing forward rapidly. On the thirteenth, Mocha, surrounded by its ruined walls, whereon date trees were growing, was sighted, and on the mountains beyond were espied vast coffee fields. Passepartout was ravished to behold this celebrated place, and thought that with its circular walls and dismantled fort it looked like an immense coffee cup and saucer. The following night they passed through the strait of Bab el Mandeb, which means in Arabic, the Bridge of Tears, and the next day they put in at Steamer Point, northwest of Aden Harbor, to take in coal. This matter of fueling steamers is a serious one at such distances from the coal mines. It costs the Peninsular Company some eight hundred thousand pounds a year. In these distant seas coal is worth three or four pounds sterling a ton. The Mongolia had still sixteen hundred and fifty miles to traverse before reaching Bombay, and was obliged to remain four hours at Steamer Point to coal up. But this delay, as it was foreseen, did not affect Phileas Fogg's program. Besides, the Mongolia, instead of reaching Aden on the morning of the fifteenth, when she was due, arrived there on the evening of the fourteenth, a gain of fifteen hours. Mr. Fogg and his servant went ashore at Aden to have the passport again visaed. Fix, unobserved, followed them. The visa procured, Mr. Fogg returned on board to resume his former habits, while Passepartout, according to custom, sauntered about among the mixed population of Somalis, Banyans, Parsis, Jews, Arabs, and Europeans, who comprised the twenty-five thousand inhabitants of Aden. He gazed with wonder upon the fortifications which make this place the Gibraltar of the Indian Ocean, and the vast cisterns where the English engineers were still at work, two thousand years after the engineers of Solomon. "'Very curious, very curious,' said Passepartout to himself on returning to the steamer. "'I see that it is by no means useless to travel if a man wants to see something new.' At six p.m. the Mongolia slowly moved out of the roadstead, and was soon once more on the Indian Ocean. She had a hundred and sixty-eight hours in which to reach Bombay, and the sea was favorable, the wind being in the northwest, and all sails aiding the engine. The steamer rolled but little. The ladies in fresh toilets reappeared on deck, and the singing and dancing were resumed. The trip was being accomplished most successfully and Passepartout was enchanted with the congenial companion which chance had secured him in the person of the delightful Fix. On Sunday, October 20th, towards noon, they came in sight of the Indian coast. Two hours later the pilot came on board. A range of hills lay against the sky in the horizon, and soon the rows of palms which adorn Bombay came distinctly into view. The steamer entered the road formed by the islands in the bay, and at half-past four she hauled up at the quays of Bombay. Phileas Fogg was in the act of finishing the thirty-third rubber of the voyage, and his partner and himself, having by a bold stroke captured all thirteen of the tricks, concluded this fine campaign with a brilliant victory. The Mongolia was due at Bombay on the twenty-second. She arrived on the twentieth. This was a gain to Phileas Fogg of two days since his departure from London, and he calmly entered the fact in the itinerary in the column of gains. End of chapter 9 Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Translated by George Makepeace Towell Chapter 10 In which Passepartout is only too glad to get off with the loss of his shoes.
Everybody knows that the great reverse triangle of land with its base in the north and its apex in the south, which is called India, embraces 1,400,000 square miles, upon which is spread unequally a population of 180 millions of souls. The British crown exercises a real and despotic dominion over the larger portion of this vast country, and has a governor-general stationed at Calcutta, governors at Madras, Bombay, and in Bengal, and a lieutenant-governor at Agra. But British India, properly so called, only embraces 700,000 square miles, and a population of from 100 to 110 millions of inhabitants. A considerable portion of India is still free from British authority, and there are certain ferocious Rajas in the interior who are absolutely independent. The celebrated East India Company was all-powerful from 1756, when the English first gained a foothold on the spot where now stands the city of Madras, down to the time of the great Sepoy insurrection. It gradually annexed province after province, purchasing them of the native chiefs, whom it seldom paid, and appointed the governor-general and his subordinates, civil and military. But the East India Company has now passed away, leaving the British possessions in India directly under the control of the crown. The aspect of the country, as well as the manners and distinctions of race, is daily changing. Formerly one was obliged to travel in India by the old cumbrous methods of going on foot or on horseback, in palanquins or unwieldy coaches. Now fast steamboats ply on the Indus and the Ganges, and a great railway, with branch lines joining the main line at many points on its route, traverses the peninsula from Bombay to Calcutta in three days. This railway does not run in a direct line across India. The distance between Bombay and Calcutta, as the bird flies, is only from 1,000 to 1,100 miles, but the deflections of the road increase this distance by more than a third. The general route of the Great Indian Peninsula Railway is as follows. Leaving Bombay, it passes through Salsetta, crossing to the continent opposite Tanna, goes over the chain of the western Ghats, runs thence northeast as far as Burmhampur, skirts the nearly independent territory of Bundelkhand, ascends to Allahabad, turns thence eastwardly, meeting the Ganges at Benares, then departs from the river a little, and descending southeastward by Berdivian, and the French town of Chandernagore has its terminus at Calcutta. The passengers of the Mongolia went ashore at half-past four p.m. At exactly eight the train would start for Calcutta. Mr. Fogg, after bidding good-bye to his whist partners, left the steamer, gave his servant several errands to do, urged it upon him to be at the station promptly at eight, and, with his regular step, which beat to the second, like an astronomical clock, directed his steps to the passport office. As for the wonders of Bombay, its famous city hall, its splendid library, its forts and docks, its bazaars, mosques, synagogues, its Armenian churches, and the noble pagoda on Malabar Hill, with its two polygonal towers, he cared not a straw to see them. He would not deign to examine even the masterpieces of Elephanta, or the mysterious Hypogea, concealed southeast from the docks, or those fine remains of Buddhist architecture, the Canharian grottoes of the island of Salsetta. Having transacted his business at the passport office, Phileas Fogg repaired quietly to the railway station, where he ordered dinner. Among the dishes served up to him, the landlord especially recommended a certain giblet of native rabbit, on which he prided himself. Mr. Fogg accordingly tasted the dish, but despite its spice sauce found it far from palatable. He rang for the landlord, and on his appearance said, fixing his clear eyes upon him, "'Is this rabbit, sir?' "'Yes, my lord,' the rogue boldly replied. "'Rabbit from the jungles.' "'And this rabbit did not mew when he was killed?' "'Mew, my lord? What a rabbit, mew! I swear to you. Be so good, landlord, as not to swear. But remember this. Cats were formerly considered in India as sacred animals. That was a good time. For the cats, my lord? Perhaps for the travellers as well.' After which Mr. Fogg quietly continued his dinner. 
Fix had gone on shore shortly after Mr. Fogg, and his first destination was the headquarters of the Bombay police. He made himself known as a London detective, told his business at Bombay and the position of affairs relative to the supposed robber, and nervously asked if a warrant had arrived from London. It had not reached the office. Indeed, there had not yet been time for it to arrive. Fix was sorely disappointed, and tried to obtain an order of arrest from the director of the Bombay police. This the director refused, as the matter concerned the London office, which alone could legally deliver the warrant. Fix did not insist, and was fain to resign himself to await the arrival of the important document. But he was determined not to lose sight of the mysterious rogue as long as he stayed in Bombay. He did not doubt for a moment, any more than Passepartout, that Phileas Fogg would remain there, at least until it was time for the warrant to arrive. Passepartout, however, had no sooner heard his master's orders on leaving the Mongolia than he saw at once that they were to leave Bombay as they had done Suez and Paris, and that the journey would be extended at least as far as Calcutta, and perhaps beyond that place. He began to ask himself if this bet that Mr. Fogg talked about was not really in good earnest, and whether his fate was not in truth forcing him, despite his love of repose, around the world in eighty days. Having purchased the usual quota of shirts and shoes, he took a leisurely promenade about the streets, where crowds of people of many nationalities, Europeans, Persians with pointed caps, Banyas with round turbans, Sindhis with square bonnets, Parsis with black mitres, and long-robed Armenians were collected. It happened to be the day of a Parsi festival. These descendants of the sect of Zoroaster, the most thrifty, civilized, intelligent, and austere of the East Indians, among whom are counted the richest native merchants of Bombay, were celebrating a sort of religious carnival, with processions and shows, in the midst of which Indian dancing girls, clothed in rose-colored gauze, looped up with gold and silver, danced airily, but with perfect modesty, to the sound of viols and the clanging of tambourines. It is needless to say that Passepartout watched these curious ceremonies with staring eyes and gaping mouth, and that his countenance was that of the greenest booby imaginable. Unhappily for his master, as well as himself, his curiosity drew him unconsciously farther off than he intended to go. At last, having seen the Parsee carnival wind away in the distance, he was turning his steps towards the station when he happened to espy the splendid pagoda on Malabar Hill, and was seized with an irresistible desire to see its interior. He was quite ignorant that it is forbidden to Christians to enter certain Indian temples, and that even the faithful must not go in without first leaving their shoes outside the door. It may be said here that the wise policy of the British government severely punishes a disregard of the practices of the native religions. Passepartout, however, thinking no harm, went in like a simple tourist, and was soon lost in admiration of the splendid Brahmin ornamentation which everywhere met his eyes when of a sudden he found himself sprawling on the sacred flagging. He looked up to behold three enraged priests, who forthwith fell upon him, tore off his shoes, and began to beat him with loud savage exclamations. The agile Frenchman was soon upon his feet again, and lost no time in knocking down two of his long-gowned adversaries with his fists, and a vigorous application of his toes. Then, rushing out of the pagoda as fast as his legs could carry him, he soon escaped the third priest by mingling with the crowd in the streets. At five minutes before eight, Passepartout, hatless, shoeless, and having in the squabble lost his package of shirts and shoes, rushed breathlessly into the station. Fix, who had followed Mr. Fogg to the station and saw that he was really going to leave Bombay, was there upon the platform. He had resolved to follow the supposed robber to Calcutta, and farther if necessary. Passepartout did not observe the detective, who stood in an obscure corner, but Fix heard him relate his adventures in a few words to Mr. Fogg. "'I hope that this will not happen again,' said Phileas Fogg coldly, as he got into the train. Poor Passepartout, quite crestfallen, followed his master without a word. 
Fix was on the point of entering another carriage when an idea struck him which induced him to alter his plan. "'No, I'll stay,' muttered he. "'An offense has been committed on Indian soil. I've got my man.' Just then the locomotive gave a sharp screech, and the train passed out into the darkness of the night. End of chapter 10 Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Translated by George Makepeace Towell Chapter 11 In Which Phileas Fogg Secures a Curious Means of Conveyance at a Fabulous Price The train had started punctually. Among the passengers were a number of officers, government officials, and opium and indigo merchants whose business called them to the eastern coast. Passepartout rode in the same carriage with his master, and a third passenger occupied a seat opposite to them. This was Sir Francis Cromarty, one of Mr. Fogg's whist partners on the Mongolia, now on his way to join his corps at Benares. Sir Francis was a tall, fair man of fifty, who had greatly distinguished himself in the last Sepoy revolt. He made India his home, only paying brief visits to England at rare intervals, and was almost as familiar as a native with the customs, history, and character of India and its people. But Phileas Fogg, who was not traveling but only describing a circumference, took no pains to inquire into these subjects. He was a solid body traversing an orbit around the terrestrial globe. According to the laws of rational mechanics, he was at this moment calculating in his mind the number of hours spent since his departure from London, and had it been in his nature to make a useless demonstration, would have rubbed his hands for satisfaction. Sir Francis Cromarty had observed the oddity of his travelling companion, although the only opportunity he had for studying him had been while he was dealing the cards and between two rubbers, and questioned himself whether a human heart really beat beneath this cold exterior, and whether Phileas Fogg had any sense of the beauties of nature. The brigadier-general was free to mentally confess that of all the eccentric persons he had ever met, none was comparable to this product of the exact sciences. Phileas Fogg had not concealed from Sir Francis his design of going round the world, nor the circumstances under which he set out, and the general only saw in the wager a useless eccentricity and a lack of sound common sense. In the way this strange gentleman was going on, he would leave the world without having done any good to himself or anybody else. An hour after leaving Bombay, the train had passed the viaducts and the island of Salsetta, and had got into the open country. At Kalyan they reached the junction of the branch line, which descends towards southeastern India, by Kandala and Puna and passing Pawel they entered the defiles of the mountains, with their basalt bases and their summits crowned with thick and verdant forests. Phileas Fogg and Sir Francis Cromarty exchanged a few words from time to time, and now Sir Francis, reviving the conversation, observed, "'Some years ago, Mr. Fogg, you would have met with a delay at this point, which would probably have lost you your wager.' "'How so, Sir Francis?' because the railway stopped at the base of these mountains which the passengers were obliged to cross in palaquins or on ponies to Candala on the other side. Such a delay would not have deranged my plans in the least, said Mr. Fogg. I have constantly foreseen the likelihood of certain obstacles. But, Mr. Fogg, pursued Sir Francis, you run the risk of having some difficulty about this worthy fellow's adventure at the pagoda. Passepartout, his feet comfortably wrapped in his traveling blanket, was sound asleep, and did not dream that anybody was talking about him. The government is very severe upon that kind of offense. It takes particular care that the religious customs of the Indians should be respected, and if your servant were caught— Very well, Sir Francis, replied Mr. Fogg. If he had been caught he would have been condemned and punished, and then would have quietly returned to Europe. I don't see how this affair could have delayed his master. The conversation fell again. During the night the train left the mountains behind and passed Nasik, and the next day proceeded over the flat, well-cultivated country of the Kandish, with its straggling villages, above which rose the minarets of the pagodas. 
This fertile territory is watered by numerous small rivers and limpid streams, mostly tributaries of the Godavery. Passepartout, on waking and looking out, could not realize that he was actually crossing India in a railway train. The locomotive, guided by an English engineer and fed with English coal, threw out its smoke upon cotton, coffee, nutmeg, clove, and pepper plantations, while the steam curled in spirals around groups of palm trees, in the midst of which were seen picturesque bungalows, viharis, sort of abandoned monasteries, and marvelous temples enriched by the exhaustless ornamentation of Indian architecture. Then they came upon vast tracts extending to the horizon, with jungles inhabited by snakes and tigers, which fled at the noise of the train, succeeded by forests penetrated by the railway, and still haunted by elephants, which, with pensive eyes, gazed at the train as it passed. The travelers crossed beyond Milligam, the fatal country so often stained with blood by the sectaries of the goddess Kali. Not far off rose Alora with its graceful pagodas, and the famous Aurangabad, capital of the ferocious Aurangazeb, now the chief town of one of the detached provinces of the kingdom of the Nizam. It was thereabouts that Feringia, the Thugi chief, king of the stranglers, held his sway. These ruffians, united by a secret bond, strangled victims of every age in honor of the goddess death without ever shedding blood there was a period when this part of the country could scarcely be traveled over without corpses being found in every direction the english government has succeeded in greatly diminishing these murders though the thugis still exist and pursue the exercise of their horrible rites at half past twelve the train stopped at burhampur where Passepartout was able to purchase some Indian slippers, ornamented with false pearls, in which, with evident vanity, he proceeded to encase his feet. The travelers made a hasty breakfast and started off for a surger, after skirting for a little the banks of the small river Tapti, which empties into the Gulf of Cambrai near Surat. Passepartout was now plunged into absorbing reverie, up to his arrival at Bombay he had entertained hopes that their journey would end there, but now that they were plainly whirling across India at full speed a sudden change had come over the spirit of his dreams. His old vagabond nature returned to him. The fantastic ideas of his youth once more took possession of him. He came to regard his master's project as intended in good earnest, believed in the reality of the bet and therefore in the tour of the world and the necessity of making it without fail within the designated period. Already he began to worry about possible delays and accidents which might happen on the way. He recognized himself as being personally interested in the wager, and trembled at the thought that he might have been the means of losing it by his unpardonable folly of the night before. Being much less cool-headed than Mr. Fogg, he was much more restless, counting and recounting the days passed over, uttering maledictions when the train stopped, and accusing it of sluggishness, and mentally blaming Mr. Fogg for not having bribed the engineer. The worthy fellow was ignorant that while it was possible by such means to hasten the rate of a steamer, it could not be done on the railway. The train entered the defiles of the Satpur Mountains, which separate the Kandish from Bundelkund, towards evening. The next day Sir Francis Cromarty asked Passepartout what time it was, to which, on consulting his watch, he replied that it was three in the morning. This famous timepiece, always regulated on the Greenwich meridian, which was now some seventy-seven degrees westward, was at least four hours slow. Sir Francis corrected Passepartout's time, whereupon the latter made the same remark that he had done to fix and upon the general insisting that the watch should be regulated in each new meridian, since he was constantly going eastward, that it is in the face of the sun, and therefore the days were shorter by four minutes for each degree gone over. Passepartout obstinately refused to alter his watch, which he kept at London time. It was an innocent delusion which could harm no one. The train stopped at eight o'clock in the midst of a glade some fifteen miles beyond Rothal, where there were several bungalows and workmen's cabins. The conductor, passing along the carriages, shouted, "'Passengers will get out here!' 
Phileas Fogg looked at Sir Francis Cromarty for an explanation, but the general could not tell what meant a halt in the midst of this forest of dates and acacias. Passepartout, not less surprised, rushed out and speedily returned, crying, "'Monsieur! Monsieur! No more railway!' "'What do you mean?' asked Sir Francis. "'I mean to say that the train isn't going on.' The general at once stepped out, while Phileas Fogg calmly followed him, and they proceeded together to the conductor. "'Where are we?' asked Sir Francis. "'At the hamlet of Colby. Do we stop here? Certainly the railway isn't finished.' "'What? Not finished?' "'No, there's still a matter of fifty miles to be laid from here to Allahabad, where the line begins again.' "'But the papers announced the opening of the railway throughout.' What would you have, officer? The papers were mistaken. Yet you sell tickets from Bombay to Calcutta, retorted Sir Francis, who was growing warm. No doubt, replied the conductor. But the passengers know that they must provide means of transportation for themselves from Colby to Allahabad. Sir Francis was furious. Passepartout would willingly have knocked the conductor down, and did not dare to look at his master. Sir Francis said Mr. Fogg quietly. We will, if you please, look about for some means of conveyance to Alhabad. Mr. Fogg, this is a delay greatly to your disadvantage. No, Sir Francis, it was foreseen. What? You knew that the way? Not at all, but I knew that some obstacle or other would sooner or later arise on my route. Nothing, therefore, is lost. I have two days which I have already gained to sacrifice. A steamer leaves Calcutta for Hong Kong at noon on the 25th. This is the 22nd, and we shall reach Calcutta in time. There was nothing to say to so confident a response. It was but too true that the railway came to a termination at this point. The papers were like some watches which have a way of getting too fast and had been premature in their announcement of the completion of the line the greater part of the travellers were aware of this interruption, and leaving the train they began to engage such vehicles as the village could provide, four-wheel palkigaris, wagons drawn by zebus, carriages that looked like perambulating pagodas, palicans, ponies, and what not. Mr. Fogg and Sir Francis Cromarty, after searching the village from end to end, came back without having found anything. "'I shall go afoot,' said Phileas Fogg. Passepartout, who had now rejoined his master, made a wry grimace as he thought of his magnificent but too frail Indian shoes. Happily he too had been looking about him, and after a moment's hesitation said, "'Monsieur, I think I have found a means of conveyance.' "'What?' "'An elephant, an elephant that belongs to an Indian who lives but a hundred steps from here.' "'Let's go and see the elephant,' replied Mr. Fogg. They soon reached a small hut, near which, enclosed within some high palings, was the animal in question. An Indian came out of the hut, and at their request conducted them within the enclosure. The elephant, which its owner had reared not for a beast of burden but for warlike purposes, was half domesticated. The Indian had begun already, by often irritating him and feeding him every three months on sugar and butter, to impart to him a ferocity not in his nature this method being often employed by those who train the Indian elephants for battle. Happily, however, for Mr. Fogg, the animal's instruction in this direction had not gone far, and the elephant still preserved his natural gentleness. Kiauni, this was the name of the beast, could doubtless travel rapidly for a long time, and, in default of any other means of conveyance, Mr. Fogg resolved to hire him. But elephants are far from cheap in India, where they are becoming scarce, the males, which alone are suitable for circus shows, are much sought, especially as but few of them are domesticated. When, therefore, Mr. Fogg proposed to the Indian to hire Kiauni, he refused point-blank. Mr. Fogg persisted, offering the excessive sum of ten pounds an hour for the loan of the beast to Allahabad. Refused. Twenty pounds? Refused also. Forty pounds? Still refused. Passepartout jumped at each advance, but the Indian declined to be tempted. Yet the offer was an alluring one, for supposing it took the elephant fifteen hours to reach Allahabad, 
his owner would receive no less than six hundred pounds sterling. Phileas Fogg, without getting in the least flurried, then proposed to purchase the animal outright, and at first offered a thousand pounds for him. The Indian, perhaps thinking he was going to make a great bargain, still refused. Sir Francis Cromarty took Mr. Fogg aside and begged him to reflect before he went any further, to which that gentleman replied that he was not in the habit of acting rashly, that a bet of twenty thousand pounds was at stake, that the elephant was absolutely necessary to him, and that he would secure him if he had to pay twenty times his value. Returning to the Indian, whose small sharp eyes, glistening with avarice, betrayed that with him it was only a question of how great a price he could obtain, Mr. Fogg offered first twelve hundred, then fifteen hundred, eighteen hundred, two thousand pounds. Passepartout, usually so rubicund, was fairly white with suspense. At two thousand pounds the Indian yielded. "'What a price! Good heavens!' cried Passepartout. "'For an elephant!' It only remained now to find a guide, which was comparatively easy. A young Parsee, with an intelligent face, offered his services, which Mr. Fogg accepted, promising so generous a reward as to materially stimulate his zeal. The elephant was led out and equipped. The Parsee, who was an accomplished elephant driver, covered his back with a sort of saddle-cloth, and attached to each of his flanks some curiously uncomfortable howdahs. Phileas Fogg paid the Indian with some banknotes which he extracted from the famous carpet-bag, a proceeding that seemed to deprive poor Passepartout of his victuals. Then he offered to carry Sir Francis to Allahabad, which the brigadier gratefully accepted, as one traveller the more would not be likely to fatigue the gigantic beast. Provisions were purchased at Colby, and while Sir Francis and Mr. Fogg took the howdahs on either side, Passepartout got astride the saddle-cloth between them. The Parsee perched himself on the elephant's neck, and at nine o'clock they set out from the village, the animal marching off through the dense forest of palms by the shortest cut. End of chapter 11 Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Translated by George Makepeace Towell Chapter Twelve, in which Phileas Fogg and his companions venture across the Indian forests and what ensued. In order to shorten the journey, the guide passed to the left of the line where the railway was still in process of being built. This line, owing to the capricious turnings of the Vindhya Mountains, did not pursue a straight course. The Parsee, who was quite familiar with the roads and paths in the district, declared that they would gain twenty miles by striking directly through the forest. Phileas Fogg and Sir Francis Cromarty plunged to the neck in the peculiar howdahs provided for them, were horribly jostled by the swift trotting of the elephant, spurred on as he was by the skillful Parsee. But they endured the discomfort with true British phlegm, talking little and scarcely able to catch a glimpse of each other. As for Passepartout, who was mounted on the beast's back, and received the direct force of each concussion as he trod along, he was very careful, in accordance with his master's advice, to keep his tongue from between his teeth, as it would otherwise have been bitten off short. The worthy fellow bounced from the elephant's neck to his rump, and vaulted like a clown on a springboard, yet he laughed in the midst of his bouncing, and from time to time took a piece of sugar out of his pocket and inserted it in Kiuni's trunk who received it without in the least slackening his regular trot. After two hours the guide stopped the elephant and gave him an hour for rest, during which Keone, after quenching his thirst at a neighboring spring, set to devouring the branches and shrubs round about him. Neither Sir Francis nor Mr. Fogg regretted the delay, and both descended with a feeling of relief. "'Why, he's made of iron!' exclaimed the general, gazing admiringly on Keone. "'Of forged iron,' replied Passepartout, as he set about preparing a hasty breakfast. At noon the Parsee gave the signal of departure. The country soon presented a very savage aspect. Copses of dates and dwarf palms succeeded the dense forests, then vast dry plains dotted with scanty shrubs and sown with great blocks of cyanite. 
All this portion of Bundlecund, which is little frequented by travelers, is inhabited by a fanatical population, hardened in the most horrible practices of the Hindu faith. The English have not been able to secure complete dominion over this territory, which is subjected to the influence of Rajas, whom it is almost impossible to reach in their inaccessible mountain fastnesses. The travelers several times saw bands of ferocious Indians, who, when they perceived the elephants striding across country, made angry and threatening motions. The Parsee avoided them as much as possible. Few animals were observed on the route, even the monkeys hurried from their path with contortions and grimaces which convulsed Passepartout with laughter. In the midst of his gaiety, however, one thought troubled the worthy servant. What would Mr. Fogg do with the elephant when he got to Allahabad? Would he carry him on with him? Impossible. The cost of transporting him would make him ruinously expensive. Would he sell him or set him free? The estimable beast certainly deserved some consideration. Should Mr. Fogg choose to make him, Passepartout, a present of Keone, he would be very much embarrassed, and these thoughts did not cease worrying him for a long time. The principal chain of the Vindhias was crossed by eight in the evening, and another halt was made on the northern slope in a ruined bungalow. They had gone nearly twenty-five miles that day, and an equal distance still separated them from the station of Allahabad. The night was cold. The Parsee lit a fire in the bungalow with a few dry branches, and the warmth was very grateful. Provisions purchased at Colby sufficed for supper, and the travelers ate ravenously. The conversation, beginning with a few disconnected phrases, soon gave place to loud and steady snores. The guide watched Keone, who slept standing, bolstering himself against the trunk of a large tree. Nothing occurred during the night to disturb the slumbers, although occasional growls from panthers and chatterings of monkeys broke the silence. The more formidable beasts made no cries or hostile demonstration against the occupants of the bungalow. Sir Francis slept heavily, like an honest soldier overcome with fatigue. Passepartout was wrapped in uneasy dreams of the bouncing of the day before. As for Mr. Fogg, he slumbered as peacefully as if he had been in his serene mansion in Seville Row. The journey was resumed at six in the morning. The guide hoped to reach Allahabad by evening. In that case, Mr. Fogg would only lose a part of the forty-eight hours saved since the beginning of the tour. Keone, resuming his rapid gait, soon descended the lower spurs of the Vindhias, and towards noon they passed by the village of Callenger, on the Canai, one of the branches of the Ganges. The guide avoided inhabited places, thinking it safer to keep the open country, which lies along the first depressions of the basin of the great river. Allahabad was now only twelve miles to the northeast. They stopped under a clump of bananas, the fruit of which, as healthy as bread and as succulent as cream, was amply partaken of and appreciated. At two o'clock the guide entered a thick forest which extended several miles. He preferred to travel under cover of the woods. They had not as yet had any unpleasant encounters, and the journey seemed on the point of being successfully accomplished, when the elephant, becoming restless, suddenly stopped. It was then four o'clock. "'What's the matter?' asked Sir Francis, putting out his head. "'I don't know, officer,' replied the Parsee, listening attentively to a confused murmur which came through the thick branches. The murmur soon became more distinct. It now seemed like a distant concert of human voices accompanied by brass instruments. Passepartout was all eyes and ears. Mr. Fogg patiently waited without a word. The Parsee jumped to the ground, fastened the elephant to a tree, and plunged into the thicket. He soon returned, saying— a procession of Brahmins is coming this way. We must prevent their seeing us, if possible. The guide unloosed the elephant and led him into a thicket, at the same time asking the travellers not to stir. He held himself ready to bestride the animal at a moment's notice, should flight become necessary. But he evidently thought that the procession of the faithful would pass without perceiving them amid the thick foliage in which they were wholly concealed. The discordant tones of the voices and instruments drew nearer, and now droning songs mingled with the sound of the tambourines and cymbals. 
The head of the procession soon appeared beneath the trees a hundred paces away, and the strange figures who performed the religious ceremony were easily distinguished through the branches. First came the priests with mitres on their heads, and clothed in long lace robes. They were surrounded by men, women, and children, who sang a kind of lugubrious psalm, interpreted at regular intervals by the tambourines and cymbals, while behind them was drawn a car with large wheels, the spokes of which represented serpents entwined with each other. Upon the car, which was drawn by four richly comparisoned zebus, stood a hideous statue with four arms, the body colored a dull red, with haggard eyes, disheveled hair, protruding tongue, and lips tinted with betel. It stood upright upon the figure of a prostrate and headless giant. Sir Francis, recognizing the statue, whispered, The goddess of Cali, the goddess of love and death. Of death, perhaps, muttered back Passepartout, but of love, that ugly old hag, never. The Parsee made a motion to keep silence. A group of old fakers were capering and making a wild ado round the statue. These were striped with ochre and covered with cuts whence their blood issued drop by drop. Stupid fanatics who, in the great Indian ceremonies, still throw themselves under the wheels of juggernaut. Some Brahmins, clad in all the sumptuousness of oriental apparel, and leading a woman who faltered at every step, followed. This woman was young and as fair as a European. Her head and neck, shoulders, ears, arms, hands, and toes were loaded down with jewels and gems, with bracelets, earrings, and rings, while a tunic bordered with gold and covered with a light muslin robe betrayed the outline of her form. The guards who followed the young woman presented a violent contrast to her, armed as they were with naked sabers hung at their waists and long damassing pistols, and bearing a corpse on a palican. It was the body of an old man, gorgeously arrayed in the habiliments of a raja, wearing, as in life, a turban embroidered with pearls, a robe of tissue of silk and gold, a scarf of cashmere sewed with diamonds, and the magnificent weapons of a Hindu prince. Next came the musicians, and a rear-guard of capering fakers, whose cries sometimes drowned the noise of the instruments. These closed the procession. Sir Francis watched the procession with a sad countenance, and turning to the guide said, A sutty. The Parsee nodded and put his finger to his lips. The procession slowly wound under the trees, and soon its last ranks disappeared in the depths of the wood. The songs gradually died away. Occasionally cries were heard in the distance, until at last all was silence again. Phileas Fogg had heard what Sir Francis said and as soon as the procession had disappeared, asked, What is a sati? A sati, returned the general, is a human sacrifice, but a voluntary one. The woman you have just seen will be burned to-morrow at the dawn of day. Oh, the scoundrels! cried Passepartout, who could not repress his indignation. And the corpse, asked Mr. Fogg, is that of the prince her husband, said the guide, an independent raja of Bundelkund. "'Is it possible,' resumed Phileas Fogg, his voice betraying not the least emotion, "'that these barbarous customs still exist in India, and that the English have been unable to put a stop to them? "'These sacrifices do not occur in the larger portion of India,' replied Sir Francis, "'but we have no power over these savage territories, and especially here in Bundelkund. The whole district north of the Vindias is the theatre of incessant murders and pillage. The poor wretch! exclaimed Passepartout. To be burned alive! Yes, returned Sir Francis, burned alive. And if she were not, you cannot conceive what treatment she would be obliged to submit to from her relatives. They would shave off her hair, feed her on a scanty allowance of rice, treat her with contempt. She would be looked upon as an unclean creature, and would die in some corner like a scurvy dog. The prospect of so frightful an existence drives these poor creatures to the sacrifice much more than love or religious fanaticism. Sometimes, however, the sacrifice is really voluntary, and it requires the active interference of the government to prevent it. Several years ago, when I was living at Bombay, 
a young widow asked permission of the governor to be burned along with her husband's body, but, as you may imagine, he refused. The woman left the town, took refuge with an independent Raja, and there carried out her self-devoted purpose. While Sir Francis was speaking, the guide shook his head several times, and now said, "'The sacrifice which will take place tomorrow at dawn is not a voluntary one.' "'How do you know?' Everybody knows about this affair in Bundlecund, but the wretched creature did not seem to be making any resistance, observed Sir Francis. That was because they had intoxicated her with fumes of hemp and opium. But where are they taking her? To the pagoda of Pillagi, two miles from here. She will pass the night there. And the sacrifice will take place tomorrow at the first light of dawn. The guide now led the elephant out of the thicket and leaped upon his neck. Just at the moment that he was about to urge Keone forward with a peculiar whistle, Mr. Fogg stopped him, and turning to Sir Francis Cromarty said, "'Suppose we save this woman.' "'Save the woman, Mr. Fogg? I have yet twelve hours to spare. I can devote them to that.' "'Why, you are a man of heart.' "'Sometimes,' replied Phileas Fogg quietly, when I have the time. End of chapter 12 Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Translated by George Makepeace Towell Chapter 13 In which Passepartout receives a new proof that fortune favors the brave. The project was a bold one, full of difficulty, perhaps impracticable, Mr. Fogg was going to risk life, or at least liberty, and therefore the success of his tour. But he did not hesitate, and he found in Sir Francis Cromarty an enthusiastic ally. As for Passepartout, he was ready for anything that might be proposed. His master's idea charmed him. He perceived a heart, a soul, under that icy exterior. He began to love Phileas Fogg. There remained the guide. What course would he adopt? Would he not take part with the Indians? In default of his assistance it was necessary to be assured of his neutrality. Sir Francis frankly put the question to him. Officers, replied the guide, I am a Parsee, and this woman is a Parsee. Command me as you will. Excellent, said Mr. Fogg. However, resumed the guide, it is certain not only that we shall risk our lives, but horrible tortures if we are taken. "'That is foreseen,' replied Mr. Fogg. "'I think we must wait till night before acting.' "'I think so,' said the guide. The worthy Indian then gave some account of the victim, who, he said, was a celebrated beauty of the Parsi race, and the daughter of a wealthy Bombay merchant. She had received a thoroughly English education in that city, and from her manners and intelligence would be thought a European. Her name was Aouda. Left an orphan, she was married against her will to the old Raja of Bundlecund, and knowing the fate that awaited her, she escaped and was retaken, and devoted by the Raja's relatives, who had an interest in her death, to the sacrifice from which it seemed she could not escape. The Parsee's narrative only confirmed Mr. Fogg and his companions in their generous design. It was decided that the guide should direct the elephant towards the pagoda of Pillagi which he accordingly approached as quickly as possible. They halted half an hour afterwards in a copse, some five hundred feet from the pagoda, where they were well concealed, but they could hear the groans and cries of the fakers distinctly. They then discussed the means of getting at the victim. The guide was familiar with the pagoda of Pillagi, in which, as he declared, the young woman was imprisoned. Could they enter any of its doors while the whole party of Indians was plunged in a drunken sleep, or was it safer to attempt to make a hole in the walls? This could only be determined at the moment and the place themselves, but it was certain that the abduction must be made that night, and not when, at break of day, the victim was led to her funeral pyre. Then no human intervention could save her. As soon as night fell, about six o'clock, they decided to make a reconnaissance around the pagoda. The cries of the fakers were just ceasing. The Indians were in the act of plunging themselves into the drunkenness caused by liquid opium mingled with hemp, 
and it might be possible to slip between them to the temple itself. The Parsee, leading the others, noiselessly crept through the wood, and in ten minutes they found themselves on the banks of a small stream, whence, by the light of the rosin torches, they perceived a pyre of wood, on the top of which lay the embalmed body of the Raja, which was to be burned with his wife. The pagoda, whose minarets loomed above the trees in the deepening dusk, stood a hundred steps away. Come, whispered the guide. He slipped more cautiously than ever through the brush, followed by his companions. The silence around was only broken by the low murmuring of the wind among the branches. Soon the Parsee stopped on the borders of the glade, which was lit up by the torches. The ground was covered by groups of the Indians, motionless in their drunken sleep. It seemed a battlefield strewn with the dead. Men, women, and children lay together. In the background, among the trees, the pagoda of Pillagai loomed distinctly. Much to the guide's disappointment, the guards of the Raja, lighted by torches, were watching at the doors and marching to and fro with naked sabers. Probably the priests, too, were watching within. The Parsee, now convinced that it was impossible to force an entrance to the temple, advanced no farther, but led his companions back again. Phileas Fogg and Sir Francis Cromarty also saw that nothing could be attempted in that direction. They stopped and engaged in a whispered colloquy. "'It is only eight now,' said the brigadier, "'and these guards may also go to sleep.' "'It is not impossible,' returned the Parsee. They lay down at the foot of a tree and waited. The time seemed long. The guide ever and anon left them to take an observation on the edge of the wood, but the guards watched steadily by the glare of the torches, and a dim light crept through the windows of the pagoda. They waited till midnight, but no change took place among the guards, and it became apparent that their yielding to sleep could not be counted on. The other plan must be carried out, an opening in the walls of the pagoda must be made. It remained to ascertain whether the priests were watching by the side of their victim as assiduously as were the soldiers at the door. After a last consultation, the guide announced that he was ready for the attempt, and advanced, followed by the others. They took a roundabout way so as to get at the pagoda on the rear. They reached the walls about half-past twelve, without having met anyone. Here there was no guard, nor were there either windows or doors. The night was dark. The moon on the wane scarcely left the horizon and was covered with heavy clouds. The height of the trees deepened the darkness. It was not enough to reach the walls. An opening in them must be accomplished, and to attain this purpose the party only had their pocket-knives. Happily the temple walls were built of brick and wood, which could be penetrated with little difficulty. After one brick had been taken out, the rest would yield easily. They set noiselessly to work, and the Parsee on one side and Passepartout on the other began to loosen the bricks so as to make an aperture two feet wide. They were getting on rapidly when suddenly a cry was heard in the interior of the temple, followed almost instantly by other cries replying from the outside. Passepartout and the guide stopped. Had they been heard? Was the alarm being given? Common prudence urged them to retire, and they did so, followed by Phileas Fogg and Sir Francis. They again hid themselves in the wood, and waited till the disturbance, whatever it might be, ceased, holding themselves ready to resume their attempt without delay. But awkwardly enough the guards now appeared at the rear of the temple, and there installed themselves in readiness to prevent a surprise. It would be difficult to describe the disappointment of the party, thus interrupted in their work, they could not now reach the victim. How, then, could they save her? Sir Francis shook his fist, Passepartout was beside himself, and the guide gnashed his teeth with rage. The tranquil fog waited without betraying any emotion. "'We have nothing to do but to go away,' whispered Sir Francis. "'Nothing but to go away,' echoed the guide. "'Stop,' said Fogg. "'I am only due at Allahabad tomorrow before noon.' "'But what can you hope to do?' asked Sir Francis. "'In a few hours it will be daylight, and the chance which now seems lost may present itself at the last moment.' Sir Francis would have liked to read Phileas Fogg's eyes. What was this cool Englishman thinking of? 
Was he planning to make a rush for the young woman at the very moment of the sacrifice and boldly snatch her from her executioners? This would be utter folly, and it was hard to admit that Fogg was such a fool. Sir Francis consented, however, to remain to the end of this terrible drama. The guide led them to the rear of the glade, where they were able to observe the sleeping groups. Meanwhile, Passepartout, who had perched himself on the lower branches of a tree, was resolving an idea which had at first struck him like a flash, and which was now firmly lodged in his brain. He had commenced by saying to himself, What folly! And then he repeated, Why not, after all? It's a chance, perhaps the only one, and with such thoughts. Thinking thus, he slipped with the suppleness of a serpent to the lowest branches, the ends of which bent almost to the ground. The hours passed, and the lighter shades now announced the approach of day, though it was not yet light. This was the moment. The slumbering multitude became animated. The tambourine sounded. Songs and cries arose. The hour of the sacrifice had come. The doors of the pagoda swung open, and a bright light escaped from its interior, in the midst of which Mr. Fogg and Sir Francis espied the victim. She seemed, having shaken off the stupor of intoxication, to be striving to escape from her executioner. Sir Francis's heart throbbed, and, convulsively seizing Mr. Fogg's hand, found in it an open knife. Just at this moment the crowd began to move. The young woman had again fallen into a stupor caused by the fumes of hemp, and passed among the fakers who escorted her with their wild, religious cries. Phileas Fogg and his companions, mingling in the rear ranks of the crowd, followed, and in two minutes they reached the banks of the stream and stopped fifty paces from the pyre, upon which still lay the Raja's corpse. In the semi-obscurity they saw the victim, quite senseless, stretched out beside her husband's body. Then a torch was brought, and the wood, heavily soaked with oil, instantly took fire. At this moment Sir Francis and the guide seized Phileas Fogg, who in an instant of mad generosity was about to rush upon the pyre. But he had quickly pushed them aside when the whole scene suddenly changed. A cry of terror arose. The whole multitude prostrated themselves, terror-stricken on the ground. The old Raja was not dead then, since he rose of a sudden like a spectre, took up his wife in his arms, and descended from the pyre in the midst of the clouds of smoke which only heightened his ghostly appearance. Fakers and soldiers and priests, seized with instant terror, lay there with their faces on the ground, not daring to lift their eyes and behold such a prodigy. The inanimate victim was borne along by the vigorous arms which supported her, and which she did not seem in the least to burden. Mr. Fogg and Sir Francis stood erect. The Parsee bowed his head, and Passepartout was, no doubt, scarcely less stupefied. The resuscitated Raja approached Sir Francis and Mr. Fogg, and in an abrupt tone said, Let us be off! It was Passepartout himself who had slipped upon the pyre in the midst of the smoke, and, profiting by the still overhanging darkness, had delivered the young woman from death. It was Passepartout who, playing his part with a happy audacity, had passed through the crowd amid the general terror. A moment after all four of the party had disappeared in the woods, and the elephant was bearing them away at a rapid pace. But the cries and noise, and a ball which whizzed through Phileas Fogg's hat, apprised them that the trick had been discovered. The old Raja's body, indeed, now appeared upon the burning pyre, and the priests, recovered from their terror, perceived that an abduction had taken place. They hastened into the forest, followed by the soldiers, who fired a volley after the fugitives. But the latter rapidly increased the distance between them, and ere long found themselves beyond the reach of the bullets and arrows. End of chapter 13 Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Translated by George Makepeace Towell Chapter 14 In which Phileas Fogg descends the whole length of the beautiful valley of the Ganges without ever thinking of seeing it. The rash exploit had been accomplished, and for an hour Passepartout laughed gaily at his success. Sir Francis pressed the worthy fellow's hand, and his master said, 
well done, which from him was high commendation, to which Passepartout replied that all the credit of the affair belonged to Mr. Fogg. As for him, he had only been struck with a queer idea, and he laughed to think that for a few moments he, Passepartout, the ex-gymnast, ex-sergeant fireman, had been the spouse of a charming woman, a venerable, embalmed Raja. As for the young Indian woman, she had been unconscious throughout of what was passing, and now, wrapped up in a traveling blanket, was reposing in one of the howdahs. The elephant, thanks to the skillful guidance of the Parsee, was advancing rapidly through the still darksome forest, and an hour after leaving the pagoda had crossed a vast plain. They made a halt at seven o'clock, the young woman being still in a state of complete prostration. The guide made her a drink, a little brandy and water, but the drowsiness which stupefied her could not yet be shaken off. Sir Francis, who was familiar with the effects of the intoxication produced by the fumes of hemp, reassured his companions on her account. But he was more disturbed at the prospect of her future fate. He told Phileas Fogg that should Aouda remain in India, she would inevitably fall again into the hands of her executioners. These fanatics were scattered throughout the country, and would, despite the English police, recover their victim at Madras, Bombay, or Calcutta. She would only be safe by quitting India for ever. Phileas Fogg replied that he would reflect upon the matter. The station at Allahabad was reached about ten o'clock, and the interrupted line of railway being resumed would enable them to reach Calcutta in less than twenty-four hours. Phileas Fogg would thus be able to arrive in time to take the steamer which left Calcutta the next day, October twenty-fifth, at noon, for Hong Kong. The young woman was placed in one of the waiting-rooms of the station, whilst Passepartout was charged with purchasing for her various articles of toilet, a dress, shawl, and some furs, for which his master gave him unlimited credit. Passepartout started off forthwith, and found himself in the streets of Allahabad, that is, the city of God, one of the most venerated in India, being built at the junction of the two sacred rivers, Ganges and Jumna the waters of which attract pilgrims from every part of the peninsula. The Ganges, according to the legends of the Ramayana, rises in heaven, whence, owing to Brahma's agency, it descends to the earth. Passepartout made it a point, as he made his purchases, to take a good look at the city. It was formerly defended by a noble fort, which has since become a state prison. Its commerce has dwindled away, and Passepartout in vain looked about him for such a bazaar as he used to frequent in Regent Street. At last he came upon an elderly crusty Jew, who sold second-hand articles, and from whom he purchased a dress of scotch stuff, a large mantle, and a fine otter-skin police, for which he did not hesitate to pay seventy-five pounds. He then returned triumphantly to the station. The influence to which the priests of Pillajai had subjected Aouda began gradually to yield, and she became more herself, so that her fine eyes resumed all their soft Indian expression. When the poet king Ukaf Udal celebrates the charms of the queen Amanegara, he speaks thus, Her shining tresses divided in two parts encircle the harmonious contour of her white and delicate cheeks, brilliant in their glow and freshness. Her ebony brows have the form and charm of the bow of Kama, the god of love, and beneath her long silken lashes the purest reflections and a celestial light swim as in the sacred lakes of Himalaya, in the black pupils of her great clear eyes. Her teeth, fine, equal, and white, glitter between her smiling lips like dewdrops in a passion flower's half-enveloped breast. Her delicately formed ears, her vermilion hands, her little feet curved and tender as the lotus bud, glitter with the brilliancy of the loveliest pearls of Ceylon, the most dazzling diamonds of Golconda. Her narrow and supple waist, which a hand may clasp around, sets forth the outline of her rounded figure and the beauty of her bosom, where youth in its flower displays the wealth of its treasures and beneath the silken folds of her tunic she seems to have been modelled in pure silver by the godlike hand of Vic Barkarma, the immortal sculptor. It is enough to say, without applying this poetical rhapsody to Aouda, 
that she was a charming woman in all the European acceptation of the phrase. She spoke English with great purity, and the guide had not exaggerate in saying that the young Parsi had been transformed by her bringing up. The train was about to start from Allahabad, and Mr. Fogg proceeded to pay the guide the price agreed upon for his service, and not a farthing more, which astonished Passepartout, who remembered all that his master owed to the guide's devotion. He had indeed risked his life in the adventure at Pillajai, and if he should be caught afterwards by the Indians, he would with difficulty escape their vengeance. Kioni also must be disposed of. What should be done with the elephant, which had been so dearly purchased? Phileas Fogg had already determined this question. Parsi, said he to the guide, you have been serviceable and devoted. I have paid for your service, but not for your devotion. Would you like to have this elephant? He is yours. The guide's eyes glistened. "'Your honor is giving me a fortune,' cried he. "'Take him, guide,' returned Mr. Fogg, "'and I shall still be your debtor.' "'Good!' exclaimed Passepartout. "'Take him, friend. Kioni is a brave and faithful beast.' And going up to the elephant, he gave him several lumps of sugar, saying, "'Here, Kioni, here, here.' The elephant grunted out his satisfaction, and clasping Passepartout around the waist with his trunk, lifted him as high as his head. Passepartout, not in the least alarmed, caressed the animal, which replaced him gently on the ground. Soon after, Phileas Fogg, Sir Francis Cromarty, and Passepartout, installed in a carriage with Aouda, who had the best seat, were whirling at full speed towards Benares. It was a run of eighty miles, and was accomplished in two hours. During the journey the young woman fully recovered her senses. What was her astonishment to find herself in this carriage on the railway, dressed in European habiliments, and with travellers who were quite strangers to her? Her companions first set about fully reviving her with a little liquor, and then Sir Francis narrated to her what had passed, dwelling upon the courage with which Phileas Fogg had not hesitated to risk his life to save her, and recounting the happy sequel of the venture, the result of Passepartout's rash idea. Mr. Fogg said nothing, while Passepartout, abashed, kept repeating that it wasn't worth telling. Aouda pathetically thanked her deliverers, rather with tears than words. Her fine eyes interpreted her gratitude better than her lips. Then, as her thoughts strayed back to the scene of the sacrifice, and recalled the dangers which still menaced her, she shuddered with terror. Phileas Fogg understood what was passing in Aouda's mind, and offered, in order to reassure her, to escort her to Hong Kong, where she might remain safely until the affair was hushed up, an offer which she eagerly and gratefully accepted. She had, it seems, a Parsi relation who was one of the principal merchants of Hong Kong, which is wholly an English city, though on an island on the Chinese coast. At half-past twelve the train stopped at Benares, the Brahmin legends assert that this city is built on the side of the ancient Kasi, which, like Mahomet's tomb, was once suspended between heaven and earth. Though the Benares of today, which the Orientalists call the Athens of India, stands quite unpoetically on the solid earth, Passepartout caught glimpses of its brick houses and clay huts, giving an aspect of desolation to the place as the train entered it. Benares was Sir Francis Cromarty's destination, the troops he was rejoining being encamped some miles northward of the city. He bade adieu to Phileas Fogg, wishing him all success, and expressing the hope that he would come that way again in a less original but more profitable fashion. Mr. Fogg lightly pressed him by the hand. The parting of Aouda, who did not forget what she owed to Sir Francis, betrayed more warmth and as for Passepartout, he received a hearty shake of the hand from the gallant general. The railway, on leaving Benares, passed for a while along the valley of the Ganges. Through the windows of their carriage the travellers had glimpses of the diversified landscape of Bihar, with its mountains clothed in verdure, its fields of barley, wheat, and corn, its jungles peopled with green alligators, its neat villages, and its still thickly-leaved forests. Elephants were bathing in the waters of the sacred river, and groups of Indians, despite the advanced season and chilly air, were performing solemnly their pious ablutions. These were fervent Brahmins, 
the bitterest foes of Buddhism, their deities being Vishnu, the solar god, Shiva, the divine impersonation of natural forces, and Brahma, the supreme ruler of priests and legislators. What would these divinities think of India, anglicized as it is today, with steamers whistling and scudding along the Ganges, frightening the gulls which float upon its surface, the turtles swarming along its banks, and the faithful dwelling upon its borders? The panorama passed before their eyes like a flash, save when the steam concealed it fitfully from the view. The travelers could scarcely discern the fort of Chupani, twenty miles south-westward from Benares, the ancient stronghold of the Rajas of Bihar, or Gazapur and its famous rose-water factories, or the tomb of Lord Cornwallis rising on the left bank of the Ganges, the fortified town of Buxar or Patna, a large manufacturing and trading place, where is held the principal opium market of India, or Mong here, a more than European town, for it is as English as Manchester or Birmingham, with its iron foundries, edge-tool factories, and high chimneys puffing clouds of black smoke heavenward. Night came on, the train passed on at full speed, in the midst of the roaring of the tigers, bears, and wolves, which fled before the locomotive and the marvels of Bengal, Golconda, Ruangaur, Murshidabad, the ancient capital, Burdwan, Hugli, and the French town of Chandranagore, where Passport who would have been proud to see his country's flag flying, were hidden from their view in the darkness. Calcutta was reached at seven in the morning, and the packet left for Hong Kong at noon, so that Phileas Fogg had five hours before him. According to his journal, he was due at Calcutta on the 25th of October, and that was the exact date of his actual arrival. He was, therefore, neither behind hand nor ahead of time. The two days gained between London and Bombay had been lost, as had been seen in the journey across India, but it is not to be supposed that Phileas Fogg regretted them. End of chapter 14